a lost but not entirely forgotten gem of the comedy boom of the 70s and 80s sits in a vault in the CBC, waiting for one day to be digitally restored and forever be immortalized in its entirety on streaming platforms. This show is SCTV. SCTV is one of my favorite comedy TV shows of all time, for a lot of different reasons actually. The perfect cast, the iconic bits, the contrast of the at the time soon to be mega comedy superstars to the very low budget television production, and of course, it's a Canadian show, motherfuckers. That's one point for the penthouse. I'm not the most patriotic person, but god damn it if I don't feel a little tingle inside seeing homegrown Canadian mega talent on the screen making Canadian TV history. Ah, there's some good Canadian lads right there. Ricky from Willowdale and Johnny from. Wait, where's John Candy from? East York. I knew it. Knew he was from the six. This show, as you can imagine, with talent like this, was massive for those who don't know, and rivaled SNL as they both debuted a year apart. It was the first time an American broadcasting network bought rights to air a Canadian show and stayed due to popularity. And I get it, man, but like, where is it? As I'm saying this to you right now, on October 10th, 2023, SCTV has never been officially digitized in its entirety anywhere. YouTube only has certain digitized isolated skits, and the DVD volume volumes made of the show, much like the box sets of MTV's Jackass, only include isolated skits or individual 30-minute episodes cut from the original 90-minute episodes. That's not even slightly close to what a full episode was like as broadcasted. So I want to talk about this. What is SCTV? Why should its shows and skits be more faithfully commemorated? Especially because as someone who recognizes even the cultural value of the show, it should be able and easily viewed somewhere. But for those who have forgotten, let's talk about what the show actually was before we get into why I think it's so weird that it's gone. Second City Television, or otherwise referred to as SCTV, was a television program that aired from 1976 to 1984, originally on Global and then moved from different stations to finally land on the CBC. The show was conceived by Andrew Alexander, co-founder of The Second City, to bring the Second City acting troupe he was overseeing at the Toronto location to television. Thus, the show functioned much like shows produced at The Second City theaters, actors writing and improvising skits and sketches that they then performed. The show's actual narrative was that SCTV was a fictional television station, and the show would consist of a compilation of programming that would be featured on the network. SCTV quickly developed a popularity among Canadians and started to get good and important early reviews. Dennis Braithwaite of the Toronto Star wrote that SCTV was the best satire seen regularly on North American television. No, I haven't forgotten about NBC's Saturday Night. After sporadic US syndication in parts of the country, NBC picked up SCTV as a replacement for another show, The Midnight Special. SCTV flourished on NBC, making it one of the rare times that a Canadian television show successfully moved to American television. This incredible success of the series was certainly helped by the most popular skit on the show, The Great White North, with Bob and Doug McKenzie. Strange Brew, released in 1983, was received well by the public and fans of SCTV, and now garners a cult status among Canadians. However, critics largely disregard the film, noting its shortcomings on substance. Janet Maslin of the New York Times noted that the price of a ticket, which at the time was $5, could buy a beer for an experience at least as memorable as this one. However, this did not stop the public, who were still enamored with the popularity of SCTV and their most popular sketch. The film was largely marketed off of this popularity. Some trailers for the theatrical release of Strange Brew would state, From SCTV, it's Bob and Doug McKenzie and all trailers would of course showcase their antics and references to the television show and Canadian stereotypes. From this popularity, the Mackenzie brothers have garnered cultural value and are a piece of Canadiana. The sketch itself was born out of an enforcement of Canadian identity. 
Because of the differences between television commercial advertisement practices, in 1982, the CBC asked for identifiably Canadian content to fill the last two minutes of what would appear only on the Canadian broadcast of SCTV. Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas thought that this was an odd request, considering that the show was made in Canada and primarily by Canadians, made an ironic response by crafting a parody of local Canadian television and other Canadian stereotypes. The characters, Bob and Doug McKenzie, would host a fictional show in which they would discuss a stereotypically Canadian topic, such as long johns or donut chops, while drinking beer and cooking back bacon. The segment called The Great White North, or sometimes Canadian Corner, became an immediate success and began to appear on the American version of SCTV because of the immense popularity. This led to a platinum-selling comedy album, The Great White North, and the production and release of Strange Brew. Because of the popularity of extremely identifiable Canadian content, Canadians have welcomed the Mackenzie brothers not only into our pop culture, but into important historical Canadiana. On March 25th, 2020, Global News reported that a Bob and Doug Mackenzie statue was erected in Edmonton to commemorate their cultural achievement. While lighthearted, the Mackenzie brothers have a claim to be an iconic feature of Canadian culture and showcase it through their identity as Canadian characters. Strange Brew as is could be considered Canadian national cinema just by showcasing these important and iconic characters of Canadian entertainment during their peak of their cultural significance. Strange Brew can also be considered national Canadian cinema by symbolically showcasing the stake that Canadian comedians and comedic actors had in the comedy boom of the 1980s. This, of course, includes the fame and popularity of SCTV, but also its associations through cast members' careers after SCTV, including Rick Moranis and John Candy, and through other connections to the original The Second City Toronto cast and their achievements. Keymaster of Gozer, Volga Sildro, our Lord of the Sebulia, are you the gatekeeper? The comedy boom refers to a time in pop culture during the 1980s where comedians and comedic actors experienced massive or prolific careers with a surge in popularity with comedy in a variety of mediums, especially stand-up and television. However, many of these iconic comedians utilized their fame to move into having film careers, both in acting and writing. Many actors from SCTV fame moved on to Hollywood to start film careers, such as Rick Moranis, Catherine O'Hara, Eugene Levy, and Andrea Martin, and also stand-up careers like John Candy and Martin Short, who had succeeded in both career avenues. It should also be noted, while not Canadian, Harold Ramis also moved from SCTV to a Hollywood career in writing, directing, and acting in many esteemed films from this time. However, there are many other connections to the Canadian involvement in the comedy boom through the original Second City clubs, specifically the Toronto location. It is commonly known that SNL, or Saturday Night Live, alumni were either recruited or graduated from the Second City clubs before starring on the show, from the first cast in 1975 to the most current cast today. The show was created by Canadian Lorne Michaels, and he also assembled the original cast. While the Chicago location is noted for contributing Bill Murray, John Belushi, and other notables from SNL. The first cast from Toronto consisted of John Candy, but also Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner. Dan Aykroyd went on to contribute many iconic SNL sketches, such as the wild and crazy guys, Jane, you ignorant slut, and the Blues Brothers, which like Strange Brew, spun off and was made into a film. Aykroyd achieved fame from his stint on SNL, and then moved on to write and act in his own and other notable films of the time. His most successful and iconic film of this time would be Ghostbusters. Not only starring in this film, Aykroyd wrote the original script for Ghostbusters, which he then took to Harold Ramis to help develop, and then to Canadian Ivan Reitman to produce and direct. Ivan Reitman also had numerous successes in producing film at this time, such as Stripes and Animal House. The highest grossing comedy film of all time until Airplane debuted in theaters. Rick Moranis also starred in Ghostbusters as Louis Tully, a meek character with nerdy qualities that later contributed to more casting of this kind, such as being cast as Seymour Krellborn in Little Shop of Horrors, and the scientist father main character, the Honey I Shrunk the Kids series of films. Ghostbusters has become an iconic piece of Western pop culture and is a great example of the contribution of Canadian comedy in the comedy boom and in pop culture. While Ghostbusters is not explicitly Canadian in an overt sense like Bob and Doug McKenzie or a technical sense of being made within Canada like Strange Brew, it does not need to be. The outreach that SCTV, The Second City, and Associated Acts had was enough to quantify Canada's stake in the comedy scene at this time. 
Canadian comedic acts were not limited by the idea of national cinema or national television. American and Canadian audiences were on the same page in the 1980s. However, because of this, American audiences have also taken claim to these instances of comedic gold in Hollywood. But Strange Brew is, again, the, the most identifiably Canadian film of this time in comedy. It is emblematic of Canadian comedy's contribution in the 1980s comedy boom. Still within and revered in our culture today, the Mackenzie brothers are an important part of our Canadian culture, and Strange Brew is poignantly a nod to all that was accomplished on Canada's part in entertainment during the 80s. Many Canadian comedic artists associated with SCTV went on to contribute the popularity and creative achievement that comedians and comedic actors had in the 1980s. SCTV now begins its programming day. So, where did SCTV go? SCTV went into syndication, but there were some issues that dictated how the rebroadcasts were to be aired. A series of a hundred or so Frankenstein monster 30-minute episode packages were cut and edited together over the years for various TV channels. Which means that even with finally Shout making some DVD volumes of those same chopped up episodes and skits, at least there's one way to view them. One way. I'm not including the YouTube channel as it's just re-uploads of single skits. No streaming. Barely any bootlegs, and there's still no complete collection of the original 90 minute episodes either than what would be stored in places, like the studios who chose to archive them. So why did they cut them up? Well, apparently, like streamers and YouTubers actually, the show didn't exactly acquire music licenses to cover, parody, or even play a lot of the music that was on the show. Dave Thomas confirmed that there definitely was some illegal lifting of music. So releasing every episode intact would most likely cost more than it would be worth. For profit, that is. I think that clearly, like the Canadian government has done before in preserving our art and culture, there should be some work done to properly archive and make accessible to the public such an important show to the Canadian art canon. Why do we make a point to preserve Canadian arts and culture in Canada? CanCon laws, for example. Yet one of our greatest television successes can't even get a Netflix documentary released that talks about its legacy and importance? Give me my Canadian TV!